Hello and thank you for checking in on this week's episode. Apologies for the nasally sound in this intro. I'm a little bit under the weather, uh, but don't worry, on the recording of this podcast, I I sound just fine. Uh, Today's guests come with just about as inspiring a story and background as one can ask for. Marlena Fiol and Ed O'Connor join us to chat about their latest book called Based on true events that span six decades, Called is an uplifting and inspirational tale of fearless adventure and heroism that celebrates the triumph of the human spirit, persevering in the face of fear, rebellious subversion, and terrorism. Some have a story, they had a mission. Called is an expansive saga that brings to life the extraordinary contributions of two medical pioneers in the wilds of Paraguay. In their fierce determination to save floundering communities across the country and to battle the stigma and shame of leprosy, John and Clara face intractable opposition from many fronts. A medical community that rejects their unorthodox and revolutionary practices, governments that threaten imprisonment, and neighbouring villagers who vow to kill them. You can find a link to Call in the show notes among all of the links mentioned throughout the show. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we are so lucky to be joined with the fabulous authors Marlena Fiol and Ed O'Connor. Thank you both so much for joining me on the podcast. How are you both today? We're doing well, John. It's great to be with you. We are in Eugene, Oregon, and it is blossoming for the spring. It is gorgeous. I'm so jealous. It's nothing but rain over here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Lovely stuff. Uh, now, before we get on to uh, the main topics of today's interview, um, would you both be able to give us a little bit more information about yourselves, like your background, just uh, just generally speaking, just before we get into the main topics? So uh, topics, education, uh, undergraduate from Boston College, uh, an MBA from Harvard Business School, a PhD in industrial psychology from the University of Akron. Worked for General Electric for several years in manufacturing positions, uh, in the 1960s and on into the early 1970s, uh, decided I wanted to teach, went to uh, the appropriate education and then taught at the University of Tennessee, the University of Georgia, University of Texas, University of Colorado and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Also, I have been in business with the woman to my right for 25 years or thereabouts. We had a speaking consulting business that was very productive and uh, we learned to work together. Or, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> or, so and we, it's been very important to our relationship to work together, but that's a topic we can take up further. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Paraguay, South America. I was the daughter of medical missionaries there. And we can talk more about that since that relates to the books that we'll be talking about. Uh, I came to the States when I was 19, um, basically escaping a very uh, traumatic childhood as a sinful daughter of um, religious, um, in a religious community. And we can talk more about that later if we want. Um, But anyway, I I, uh, stumbled along and then 30 years ago, I stumbled into this man and this relationship and it has been I, it, a lot of my background is the same as Ed, so I've been a but, but, but. I've been a professor and I've been uh, in the consulting business with Ed, um, and now in the past five years we've been writing together. Undergraduate degree, MBA from the University of Illinois, PhD from the oh. University of Illinois, speaks five <laughs> languages fluently, uh, has taught at the New York University, NYU, which is quite prestigious in the United States, and then we came to Colorado and met in a job interview. Yeah, that was 30 years Oh, ago. really? Is that how you met? That yes. we did. Oh, and, the wow. rest, and the rest is history, as they say. And we were totally <laughs> unimpressed with each other. Oh, yeah. But what? six months later, that <laughs> <please. laughs> That's great. Wow. Well, uh, it's certainly not been sitting around too much. Uh, that is quite uh, a fair few things to go uh, over. Now, the, you've already mentioned quite a few of the topics that um, I'm really interested in asking the both of you. Um, but if we can just start off right at the start, um, Marlene, about Paraguay. I'm super interested in this. Growing up in Paraguay, seeing Dr. John and Clara Schmidt's um, legacy being built and, and sustained firsthand. I just want to know a big question, a small question to a to a big answer, really. Um, what was it like 
in Paraguay as a young child? Was Paraguay a, a sort of a nice place to for a young person to grow up in? Like, you know, give me some set, set the scene, as it were. All right. So I have to say that as a child, it was just home and I didn't yeah. know any different. And I think that's what any one of us would say about the home that we grew up in. Uh, looking back, however, uh, retrospectively, um, it was a strange childhood. I grew up on a leprosy station. My parents founded in 1951, the year I was born. And um, in fact, my parents revolutionized how leprosy is treated on the planet today. We can go into that a bit more later, but this was a leprosy compound. Um, my father went out on horseback all over the country looking for patients who were scared to death because at that time they tended to be locked up as prison, treated like animals. And only the most severely ill patients would come and live with us on the station. And so I grew up um, it was a low German Mennonite community in the middle of the wilds of Paraguay. So very strange. But as I said, as a child, I, I it was it was home. It's just the way it was. And you were able to live on that leprosy station until you completed the fifth grade? Yeah, I was nine when my parents sent me to the capital city of Paraguay. And I was basically on my own. Um, I got myself into a lot of trouble. Um, and in fact, I've, I've written a memoir about some of the bumpy ride um, that got me to where I am today. Um, it's Nothing Bad Between Us uh, is the name of the memoir, but it is basically a story of forgiveness and reconciliation. My father and I had a horrendous relationship when I was young, and uh, it's a story of, of reconciliation. Just to pick up the point about her leaving home at nine and being on her own completely by the time she's 10 or 12, these are not bad parents. These are people who value education. They are well-educated, a doctor and a nurse who also has a bachelor's degree in addition to being her nursing degree. They cared about their children's education and thus there was no way for that education to occur way out in a remote area of Paraguay so she was given the opportunity in the capital city to gain a very strong education. Yeah, I would just add to that, that they, uh, they, they so represent, I think all of us human beings who are fallible and, and broken in many ways, but we have possibilities to step up and become extraordinary, which they did. I mean, they really changed this world for the better. Yeah. And so they were, they were ordinary and broken people who did the extraordinary. Yes. Great summary. Yeah, that is a really great summary. Did you feel a heck of a lot of pressure then as a young person um, growing up in that environment with so much, you know, it was so much going on and, and, and so, you know, huge expectations on, it sounds like from, you know, from what I know already, it sounds like such a, a huge expectation on everything over there. How did that make you feel? Um, yes, there was pressure to live up to the standards of particularly a father who uh, expected nothing but the best and the most from all of us. And from himself. And from himself. In addition to that, the pressures in a Mennonite community to live by standards uh, that were held very, very strictly. And I was a very rebellious kid. So that was not a good mix. Yeah. 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 That is, it's, it really is fascinating. And, and uh, we'll go back to this, um, if that's okay, in a little bit. I am just going to sneak in a question um, that I had written down there because I think it's more prominent right now. Um, so we will go back to, um, I'll, I'll introduce this topic uh, more properly. When starting to, develop this idea of you know bringing called writing called writing this story going through all the resources which again I've got a couple of questions to ask you about that because it holds such a I guess kind of a mixed area um, in the past for you lots of you know challenging moments there was it challenging to bring this to the forefront again and, and have it as such a large part of every day you know writing this this book was that difficult for you? 
So I will uh, answer that first and then maybe Ed wants yeah. to add something to that. Writing my memoir, which I wrote before we, be before we began to write called, uh, was a healing journey for me. It was very important to, for me, I began writing it actually for myself and then mm. eventually had early readers ask me to, to write more of it and share more of it for others. Yeah. By the time we were writing called, um, our healing journey is never finished. So I don't believe that, that, that that's done. However, much of the wound that had to do with my father and me, I had dealt with. And so writing called, it, it, was, it, it has felt like a privilege to bring the story of these two people who, whom much has been written about over the years, but we wanted to bring this to a more general public. And that felt like an honor, like a privilege. Yeah. I have to tell just a really quick little story. Yeah. There's a, um, a person that was uh, one of their sponsors from the Mennonite Central Committee mm -hmm. uh, who worked with my parents in Paraguay back in the 1960s, he was there, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and he's still alive. And he read my memoir um, and he said he cried. Um, it, was, uh, it was very hard for him to read about John Schmidt, whom he knew, John and Clara, whom he knew personally to read, read this about them. Mm -hmm. Then he heard that we were writing called and Edgar Stoves wrote me and he says, I need to talk to you. And I, I hadn't talked to him in decades. And I said, oh, it would be great to talk to you. So we, we talk and he says, I have two questions for you. He says, number one, why are you writing called? And I said, or we both answered and we said, because we feel like this is such an extraordinary story and the, the world is longing for this kind of inspiring story. And he said, number two, given that your father beat you until you were bloody, can you be objective in telling his story? And my response was, I don't think any of us are ever objective, yeah. but if anything, I lean toward more respect and more honor toward him and my mother than maybe most children. So yeah. that's just a little story about yeah. The, yeah, the effects of history on the writing process. And I think yeah. your respect has grown immensely from, I mean, it was great to start with. But to dig into library archives and to realize what has been written about your parents and what was written by them and to them and the struggles they went through that a child doesn't know. I mean, most of us don't know those kinds of things about our parents. So the woman to my right here knows more about her parents than anybody else I've ever met. And, uh, and diaries, they were prolific writers. So we have their inner journey. The subjective journey well. and the objective information from the outside, which is extensive. And my respect for them grew immensely. I was fortunate to know them when they were still alive, but I had no idea of what they had accomplished and who they were. Yeah. So Ed, did you find out a lot through this, through going through those resources while prepping called? Is this where it sort of this? Obviously, you were aware of this, but is this where you know during this um, the sort of pre-writing stage, the research area? Is this where this world kind of opened up to you to the to the full extent that it is now? I don't know that it could ever open up to the full extent of what it was, and I mean that out of respect for what it was mm -hmm. or is, and the impact they have had. But to go back to your question, certainly it opened up for me. It opened up question after question after question that we will never know the answer to. And it opened up increasing respect and increasing interest and increasing fascination. I, this was not work. This was a privilege. I mean, to be able to get access to the kind of information both from them and from the world outside of them mm -hmm. and to know people in that kind of depth who were worth knowing. Yeah. It's been exciting and a privilege. It's fantastic. It, it, yeah, it, it, it certainly sounds like it. Um, it was mentioned um, at the start of the book that there was, I believe I'm getting this right, 740 sources 
that you found that became the basis of called now that to me sounds like a research section of the writing process was was quite the task um, can you tell us a little bit more about the the prep and what sort of the sources that you found and were able you know which you had around and and uh, how that came he was to be. the major researcher and it took six really? years wow yeah the research yeah yeah, it took six years, not that that was the only thing we were doing during those six years. So there's 740 that are actually cited in for the book that are cited in a on a web page, on a web page mm -hmm. that the readers can go to. Mm -hmm. Those are the only the 740 that we chose to use. The pile <laughs> was much bigger than that. And so it became a case of going through sources one at a time or going down through them, going, there's something that we've got to take into consideration, yeah. dictating that out and then combining it with all of the other materials. Mm -hmm. And again, many others, there was nothing there. It was interesting, but not fundamental to what we needed to communicate about these people. Yeah, We traveled, uh, we traveled in <laughs> South America in a, to do this research. We traveled to various archives around the United States. Um, there was also an archive in Canada. So we had uh, a number of, of people opened up uh, and helped us. Librarians and archivists were incredibly helpful in this process. There was an archivist in uh, Paraguay, in, in the Chaco of West Paraguay, who not only gave us all kinds of written materials about John and Clara's story from the 1940s when they were in Western Paraguay, but also personal anecdotes. His, his mother had been <laughs> one of John and Clara's first nurses in training in the Chaco of Paraguay in 1943. Yeah. So, and what did we learn from her through her son? Uh, that the young nurses would uh, look at John Schmidt a little longer than was appropriate. Oh, really? <laughs> he was a handsome dude. <laughs> And he was 30 years old or and, in his and early single. 30s and single. When he first went to the chocolate. Yeah. Very, right. very interesting for them, I am sure. <laughs> he was but, not yet married, as you said. Two years later, he came back to the United States and married uh, Clara, his lifelong partner. Mm -hmm. Their interesting part of their story is that their, their um, coming to know each other. Courtship. All, courtship is what we normally call it because we get together and we see each other and we interact. They didn't have that possibility. He's in Paraguay. She's in Kansas. They have met once before he took off to Paraguay. And they wrote letters to each other. Sometimes those letters took as long as three months to get back and forth in the 1940s from Paraguay to the United States and vice we versa. We shouldn't give away the whole story here. Though. Well, I don't give away the whole story, but can you imagine a courtship occurring that way? And a courtship where they got to know each other far better than most people do because they talk in depth in those letters about who they were and about what their they values wanted. And their what values. they wanted. And they weren't d distracted by yeah, these kinds of things where, you know, sometimes it's possible to get distracted. Yeah, it's still possible. <laughs> That's great. So you mentioned, obviously, you've you've both run uh, businesses together. You've worked very closely with each other um, on, you know, for many years. Now, when it comes to writing and, um, you know, uh, writing a book and, and, and everything that is involved in that, um, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to to sort of share that role as it can be quite, you know, a, a sort of solo focused venture. So I would love uh, to know how you found the process of working together creatively on 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 this book and how that might have differed to your own solo ventures or academic writings in the, in, the, in the past. First of all, we've been we have been writing together for almost thirty years, and so it was books and articles in the business uh, world yeah. until five years ago, mm -hmm. and then we began this process where we have a we had a podcast for three seasons. We have a YouTube channel, we blog, um, and we're writing these books. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think our process has changed that much over the decades that we've been working together. Um, short version is that I tend to write the first draft, mm -hmm. and then I ship it over to Ed for his critique. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And when he criticizes it, we fight mm -hmm. like crazy. <laughs> and then there's it, a little heat in our relationship, but uh, that's a good thing in a relationship. So I think in the end, it is always a product that we're both proud of. And it's a product that is much more positive than it was before we had big fights about it. So, yeah. Do you find that we go back to the very first piece of this writing process about books? It is Marlena's memoir, and she's writing it, as she said earlier in this interview, for her own sake, for her own growth. Mm -hmm. And she reads to me, and we're sitting in a living room in a home we owned in Tucson, Arizona. I can see her in the chair she was in in the corner. I can see myself on the couch looking at her. And she said, I'd like to read this to you. And it's this small piece of her life that she has just clicked out on her keyboard. Yeah. And I realized then how good she was at this new form of writing because the style is very, very different than anything we did in the academic world. Mm. And I was moved by what she was able to express and incredibly uh, anxious that she continue the process, not only for her own sake, but to share it with others. So that's a very early piece of the writing. I think there is support in both directions for what we do. And I think that's very important. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Has writing always sort of been there for the both of you? Has it always been that sort of outlet creatively? Or is this a, you know, obviously it's a big part of the academic world and, and teaching and all of that, but specifically getting, you know, the art of writing, I guess some may put it, has that been, um, you know, prevalent in, in your lives for a long time? Um, the writing in our academic lives was in the publish or perish world where you, we had to write and we had to publish. I loved doing it, but it was part of a job. Yeah. Um, and we had both decided not to perish from very early <laughs> on. Long before we got together, we had successfully not perished in the academic world. Yeah, we were very successful, but it felt like a job. Yeah. And at the time, if you'd asked me 10 years ago when I was still fully in the academic and business consulting world, um, mm. do you love your job? I would say I, I am so fortunate because I get paid to do what I love to do. It's incredible freedom. And yet, I can honestly say that when I began writing the memoir, and now after writing Called, and as we're working on the third book, I, I, I'm using the same word we used for the title of the book, but I feel called for the first time in my life. Um, yeah. It feels like something coming from deeper within me than the academic writing. As much fun as that was, this yeah. feels different. Yeah. yeah. So go, so sticking with this, you feel called. Now, obviously, I want to talk about uh, becoming who we truly are. Now, uh, obviously, I've had the pleasure of working with you um, for the past few months uh, on becoming who we truly are. Would you be able to tell the listeners um, about this mission and why the calling of uh, spreading this message is so important to you? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. So yes, Becoming Who We Truly Are is our YouTube channel. And we are so fortunate to be working with you, Johnny, because it's <laughs> gotten better and better as we're working with you. The mission fundamentally from the beginning has been, and it hasn't changed um, since we began the channel a year ago. Over uh, a year. Last April or so. Yeah, about a year ago. Yeah. Um, it is the the purpose is for us and for anyone who comes and joins us and listens to views our our YouTube episodes. It's to grow toward becoming the truest and best selves that we can become. And I just feel like in the past year, it, it's just become more and more important to me to embrace that message for myself and to share it with the world that I, 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 I said this earlier in the interview, but I think we are longing mm. for that kind of growth and that kind of self-understanding and understanding of others in this divisive, crazy, angry world. Um, mm. So we wanna put a light out there and um, for ourselves and for others. And that's really important well, that this is not about a, a, a message for others. It's a, can we grow together yeah. to become better selves? Yeah. All of us. 
Yeah, I mean, in this in this time, in the past few years, um, you know, at least, um, I think, it, you know, things have happened in the world that is just, you know, awful. And I think that sense of uh, people universally coming together and 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 coming as a group and that communion, I think it's so much, very much needed. Have you found in your experience of doing uh, the shows and, and and sharing your experiences with people, have you felt that sort of um, community through through um, you know, sort of spiritual growth, I guess. We are still working on building that community. It's a it's a long process, um, but we certainly have a small community that has begun to gather and form around some of the some of the ideas that we have, and so we're encouraged. But it's a it's a long process. Why a podcast? Why YouTube channel? Why putting out? other written forms, including books, they all have the same purpose. They all allow us to wake up to who we are and what's possible for ourselves. And that's the same focus we had in our consulting and speaking business. It was to allow people to come to know who they are as we ourselves are simultaneously growing in our interactions with them. So not much has changed in our focus over a lot, a lot of years but the mechanisms, the channels that we're going through are new to us. And I mean, for people well into their lives, this new technology thing is just crazy. Why are you doing this, people say? That's why we need people like John. Yes. <laughs> Help, please. <laughs> I think you do a great job. Um, so to get a flavor of the weekly video series, you can head over to YouTube and search Becoming Who We Truly Are, uh, and you'll find heaps of insightful content. There's also going to be uh, links in the show notes to uh, everything that we've mentioned um, and all more information about called your memoir uh, and websites, etc., like that. Um, now, I know you are both tremendously busy, busy people, but what's next? Have you had a chance to think about what might come next? Um, you mentioned you are currently writing the third book. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, the running title of the third book is Healing the Wound One Layer at a Time. And it is uh, taking the life of Dr. John Schmidt, the protagonist of Called My Father, and through his memories of some of the craziest adventures in his life, he goes through those memories and begins to see something rather tragic in that timeline. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy of this hero, Dr. John Schmidt, is that he did phenomenal things out in the world. Mm -hmm. And he was barely ever able to look at his own inner demons. And we glimpsed a few of us in his personal circles, got a glimpse of that very occasionally, but that it, he was not able to look at a lot of the inner struggle that drove a lot of what he did. So this is a tracing of, yes, some crazy adventure stories, but also him beginning to, to peel back the layers that were heaped up during his life and look at healing that the, the wound that he never, ever was able to really confront when he was living. Yeah. So to add on to that, how dare we write about Dr. John and his wife, Clara? And that comes to us as a uh, almost reprimand from members of the family. Uh, and possibly other people might wonder, what, could I dig into my parents' materials? Could I dig into their life? And the audacity of, Do I have of that privilege? writing about their inner journey, right? Um, and the, the piece I wanted to add to complete that question is an answer. After Dr. John was deceased, uh, Marlena's mother, Clara, brought to her, handed to her, asked her to take with her, large boxes of materials that they had collected throughout their life. Diaries and the letters. Very personal materials and said, you are my writer, would you please write our story? And so part of this whole thing, this movement forward, this digging into their life came mm -hmm. uh, as a request from them. They had tried to publish this material in various forms throughout their life, with some level of success in narrow circles. Yeah. We were asked to take it, or Marlena was asked to take it a step further, and she sort of brought me along in the process. <laughs> we, 
We and start it's really our passion. Absolutely. I was going to say, so after get, I mean, that's was it. It must have been really rewarding in a sense to to sort of get this out on the shelves. Then after all of this work, especially you know, with the um, with you know the, the proposition put upon you, um, how did that sort of feel to to get it done? <laughs> Uh, it felt very rewarding and it still yeah. does. And that is the overriding experience that we have. There are also moments when some of our family members are unhappy that we have divulged personal um, details about our parents. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not happy. Um, yeah. That's not, that was never our intention um, to create problems within the family and it's only one or two family members out of I have seven siblings so we have a huge family and most of them are are very much on board and in fact have have yeah. written part of but there's an update at the end of called that two of my brothers have written that is so supportive of yeah. the work that we've done how do you um how do you sort of sort of walk that line between being honest and then sort of sparing the feelings of loved ones because that's a that's a tough one isn't it because you want to you want to do things justice but then also it's it's it can be very challenging how do you sort of gauge that um i have a i have a <laughs> a, a question that i ask myself and uh i challenge myself to honestly answer that question before i write anything that would be considered uh too personal perhaps, and that is, what is my motivation for writing it? Is the motivation to portray someone in a, whether it's my parents or somebody else in the book in a light yeah. that's unfavorable, is the motivation to simply be titillating without having a, 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 a deeper intention for why that material is in there? Mm -hmm. To the extent that I can honestly answer that question as the motivation is for the larger story to be to be there and to tell the larger story yeah. we're trying to tell for instance there are some love scenes between john and clara in called why are they there they're partly there mostly there to show the character development mm -hmm. a very shy mennonite nurse who has learned in her mennonite upbringing that her body is something sinful mm -hmm. and John Schmidt this crazy man who also is a Mennonite but for some reason doesn't have those inhibitions helps her find joy in her body that's part of their story it's part of how they develop together it is partly a love story called mm -hmm. and so there was a reason for those intimate details um, and it wasn't just to kind of be titillating um, yeah so I'm going back to something Marlena said earlier. I think it's been very important to portray these people as ordinary people who accomplished extraordinary things. These are part of the ordinary life. Everything that's there is part of the ordinary lives. And our hope is that somebody reading it can go, oh, oh yeah, I, I too am able to maybe do the kinds of things they did. Or I maybe. might be inspired by this. They're not some on a pedestal people. These are just like me. And so that's been part of the impetus yeah. to write it the way we've written it, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's um, so the story mixes adventure, romance, uh, a call to service uh, and, and so much more. Was it sort of difficult getting all those themes in there? Because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's people's lives, isn't it? It's, it's so much more bigger than, than a, a sort of a, with the, the whole backdrop of the novel. It's so huge. It's an epic. Was it sort of difficult to, you know, balance all of those different genres and, and those different themes going on? I can honestly say that it was not. And I, I believe that the reason it was not, because I, I don't have experience writing a saga like this, so it should have been difficult. And the reason I believe it was not is because I had so much material to work with. I mean, the, the real challenge was to sift out what was not essential for the story. Yeah. But there was so much in terms of their love relationship, in terms of their service in Paraguay, in terms of their crazy adventures, 
in terms of the, the, uh, the opposition they faced from neighboring villages who didn't want lepers in their midst to governments who said, you're not doing it like the traditional way to their US sponsors who cut off funds. I mean, there was so much to work with that it honestly was not that difficult. I thought there were three books to be written. A book about the 1940s when they uh, moved into a very remote area of West Paraguay and the Chaco, um, built and expanded a hospital, opened it up and made it work. Uh, started a nursing school that still exists very successfully providing care all these years later. This was the 1940s. There's another whole, they come back to the United States and then there's a whole other adventure that began in the 1950s on through the 1960s, beginning into the 1970s of revolutionizing the way leprosy is treated on the planet. They are now in a different remote area of Paraguay they have a different calling. They have something that is new and revolutionary that they are creating together, uh, faced with significant opposition, political intrigue, et cetera. And they don't hang it up at that point in time. We left out much of what happened in their lives, but they leave that leprosy station and they go to Vietnam and they're taking care of people. They're not on one side or the other. They are human beings out there who need yeah. care. And they are in serious danger uh, in the midst of that war on numerous occasions. But that's not enough. They go back to the United States for a while. Maybe they get bored and back they go into Paraguay and they are late in their lives um, in the 1990s in another very remote area of Paraguay where a hospital is going to close if a doctor is not found. And they, they feel called. And so they give up what you and I might call a good life to go out in the wilds, save that hospital and save the community that, that surrounds that hospital. That hospital still exists today. And in fact, one of your nephews, Marlena's nephews is the physician at that hospital today. Oh, wow. And her brother lives in that community as well as other relatives. It wouldn't exist yeah. if Dr. John and Clara had not done what they did. So yes, Ed thought that there were three books. And my thought was, no, this is one arc. This is the, and so that's where sifting a lot of this out had to happen because there was yeah. so much material. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It just shows how inspiration, uh, inspirational the story has been though, to affect, you know, so many people and wanting to, that wanting them to give back and yourselves included, you know, wanting to dedicate your lives to giving back and um, and helping people and it's uh, yeah it's it's really inspiring especially from my point of view <laughs> it's uh, so uh, this podcast is based uh, obviously around audiobooks so um, it would be a crime not to mention audiobooks as the last question if that's okay so the audiobook record um, was narrated by Jack Warren who did an amazing job uh, produced by Pro Audio Voices oh yes please please can you show us the card of uh, what you got through this is the that's cover right. for the book called yeah. This is a picture of Jack Warren, who did an extraordinary job bringing okay. characters to life. I will, it, go ahead. Well, I mean, he faced phenomenal challenges. Um, some of the book occasionally uses words from low German, which Marlena spoke as a child and still speaks fluently. There is, are Spanish words in there. There may be Guarani words in there. There are. And obviously these don't just flow off our tongues if we're not brought up in those worlds, as well as English, uh, traditional German probably. And it, he made those words come forth from him as if he was a native speaker of those words. In addition, he brought forth the characters in a way that brings us to tears. I mean, we wrote this material. And yet when we listen to Jack pro produce it, provide it, provide the audio for it, I'm again moved to tears. He brought these people to life and he brought them to life over a 60 year span, which means the voices change as they age. And so uh, it's just a remarkable job by yeah. a wonderful person to work with. And maybe we should mention who uh, linked well, this up given that it's kind of in Johnny's world. Pro Audio Voices was fabulous to work with. Absolutely. And, and we just could not, I, I think Ed has spoken for both of us already, say enough good things about Jack Warren. 
So, yeah. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased you enjoyed the experience of, you know, producing this book with, yeah, with Becky and the team and and, and Jack just did an amazing job. He's such a skilled, talented guy. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about your experiences with audiobooks before this? What was your experience? Um, it was, uh, have you sort of had your eye on audiobooks coming up as they've sort of grown in popularity? Did it just sort of creep up on you as the years went by? So this man lives with buds in his ears and he listens, he <laughs> I listens read to, on an ongoing basis while doing other things all the time and started in 1988 or 1989 when there were very few audiobooks easily available. My young experience of them was um, recordings for the blind or books for the blind. My mother was legally blind and would listen to audiobooks on big records and put them on a turntable and listen to books. And I would pick out books with her as she aged that she might be interested in because we wouldn't want too much scurrilous romance in them. And, <laughs> you know, they had to fit a certain uh, perspective that she brought to the world. And I mean that respectfully. But, but in uh, by the late 1980s, I was hooked on audiobooks, but they're hard to find. And now they're readily available. Uh, we believe that they are an important and the fastest growing piece of the book market today. Yeah, There's challenge in producing them. They are expensive to produce. Yeah. But if we really want to get the message to people, and we believe we want this set of messages and call to get to people, then it, it's just, you got to have an audio book. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, definitely just um, from my experience. I mean, I've been working in audiobooks uh, sort of full time for the past five, six years. Uh, and even in my sort of short time being in that world, it has already just grown massively. I mean, when I first started, there was it was sort of half, like sort of 50 50 sort of got an audiobook produced. And now if they don't, it's what? <laughs> you, you know, it's it's a part of the market that you have to have to sort of tap so um but yeah it's, it's 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 really nice because it just sort of as you say opens up the the sort of door to more people listening to that story and and, and consuming that that story so you know that's great um but yes so we are sort of coming to an end is there anything you would like to add anything you would like to share or or you know any links that you would um you know any shout outs you want to give to uh, to any platforms well, hopefully you will uh, provide links yes, to yes. Our, our websites. There is a website that's devoted to the book called, which is called asaga.com, uh, marlenafield.com, and Becoming Who We Are, the YouTube channel. I'm sure that you'll provide those links. It's just been delightful speaking with you. And again, we can't say enough good things about working with Pro Audio Voices and also individually with you, Johnny. It's Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. That means a lot. And likewise, it's, it, it, it has been a pleasure and it is a pleasure. So, um, but yes, thank you. So uh, there will uh, be links to Marlena's uh, Facebook and Instagram account, uh, YouTube, uh, MarlenaFiol.com, as well as called as Saga, um, called as Saga.com. All the links will be there in the show notes. Uh, Marlena, Ed, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to chat with me today. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. So uh, thank you. Great to be with you. The pleasure you. was ours. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.